so many others, Mark Twain, and so many others, Faulkner, and so many others, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh, Korka should be looking at me, because if there is one book they particularly enjoyed in my teaching, that was Hester Prynne and Reverend Dimsdale in the Scarlet Letter. Later on, what they came to enjoy in American teaching was James Gaines, Ernest Gaines, and there are a few years when they had to write their MA dissertation. Almost all of them in American studies were determined to write something on Ernest Gaines. And my colleague came to me and said, what did you do in class? I said, what? He said, they all decided to write on Gaines. Well, you, you know, because the stories are so very important. Mm -hmm. And to tell you another story, that will be the last one. I was, yeah, I was particularly interested in one Canadian writer who wrote The Stone Angel, uh, Margaret Lawrence. Her famous book of essay on African literature is Long Drums and Canon. But she wrote also a glorious novel called The Stone Angel. And this is what she said. I started writing to contribute to the formation of the Canadian identity because I took the cue from African writers. Chinua Chebe, Christopher Okibo, Wale Shoinka. This was the first time a white writer confessed that she was influenced, positively influenced, by three black writers, and she decided to write about her country, taking the example from Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, the people taking example from Africa and owning it up are very few. That's why I reminded you yesterday, or every people, everybody uh, who attended yesterday, I said, you know, even, you know, groveling, old, uh, racist, uh, you know, politician, reactionary in France, if they want to get some votes, they will say, hey, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I am walk. Uh, where did they get being walk from? That's African-American balance. Right? I take a knee. What are you talking about? You see the margin coming to the, the margin coming to the center, the periphery coming to the center, you know, and all over, you know, French TV station or radio, walk, walk is up, walk, walk is up. Huh? That's NWA. You know what I mean? Nigger with attitude. Compton, always come from Compton. And we should be trying to redesign review what culture means in this world, in this contemporary world, and the contribution of black people in shaping things. Transsetters. How many people ever imitated Denzel Washington and the special way he's got to, you know? How many people thought they were somewhere rescuing a plane because they are Wesley Snipe? <laughs> Even some people are in admiration with Snoop Doggy. <laughs> you know, I'm referring to this because I don't believe in high culture and low culture. I, I approach everything. I am not a sociologist, but I prefer that. Every human being counts. Every human being, whether you are high up or low down in the gutter, I don't care. You are a human being, and you can make a contribution to life. And this is something we should be absolutely confident about in this continent. We got things to do. There are things we can do. And it is high time we start doing it. Sorry, ma'am, I'm just... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 seriously. Oh, he's here. He is. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the one who, be, who should be sitting here is here. Just allow me to introduce him. Stanley Wu is the chair of our department. 
an up and going young man, he just organized an international colloquium where African literature and African culture was discussed. And this was involving many universities here and universities in the United States. I am very, very proud to have been his teacher. And I told him once, and it was in a plane. Because he took his money, own money, got his plane ticket, got his hotel room, and attended and produced a paper. If this is not an academic, who would be an academic? And also brilliantly, you know, chairing the Department of English and being the point of admiration, you know, the rising star of all his students, male and female. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause to Professor Salu John. Professor, the chair is yours. I need to introduce you also. I need to introduce you. <laughs> good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm I'm dreadfully sorry for for keeping you waiting. I, uh, I think that they have already explained the reason why I have come a little bit late, and I don't need to come back to to this. So uh, I'm also going to introduce you to someone. Uh, I, I don't like saying my my former teacher. Um, I he used to be now. This is not my way of proceeding. But I say uh, he is my my professor. He is my professor, and he's really one of the favorite professors, academically and pedagogically. There is something that I have learned from him. When I'm teaching, I can't sit down. I always work around the room. And this I have learned from him. And my colleague and I really appreciate him. We really uh, thank him and we also pray, pray for him. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Now uh, we're going to today. We have a we have a talk uh, by our sister, our our colleague. I met her yesterday, and then we had a, a wonderful discussion, a very fruitful discussion. And today is an opportunity that we have to see how to how to really widen widen the, the discussion. Now the talk. Uh, is entitled Becoming, Writing Home, Nigerian Diaspora Women Authors in the Development of Cultural Identity and African Literature. And this is going to be by our sister, Dr. Olaicha Waduto Nabara. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, saying a few, uh, a few words uh, about Dr. Olocha, she received her PhD from Michigan State University in African American and African Studies and became a member of the uh, SU New I Genius School faculty in 2019. She teaches courses in global African literature, most specifically West African, women's and migratory literature. Her courses focus on examining identity formation among diverse African continental and diaspora subject and self-representation within literature and, and film. What is outstanding is her concerns with literature, but also with with this film, uh, which is I think that even we discussed it uh, yesterday. And my question was how uh, she managed to include both uh, the study of film and also the study of, of, of literature. Her research examined global African cultural production and cultural thought as African center artifact and method to correctively represent cultural identity as they engage the realities of race, ethnicity, and gender among transnational Africans. Uh, 
focusing on Niger in the United States and South Africa. Some of her recent publications were published in Africology, the, the Journal of Pan-African Studies, an influential in the study of the global African diaspora between uncharted theme and alternative representation and art, creativity, and politics in Africa and, and the diaspora. So this is, uh, in a few words, uh, about Dr. Uh, Olaycha, that I'm going to ask you just to give her a round of applause before we, uh, before we, before we start. Now, her talk is, uh, is very specific in the sense that uh, she is going to engage us in what we can call the new trend, which we also discussed last time, because the perception uh, is, is special and it also uh, a modern way of looking at literature with a different topic that are uh, included in the, in the, will be included in the discussion. Uh, in African literature, you had what we call the first generation of, of writers, especially what we call the post-colonial writers composed of male writers who had their own representation of the female subject. And the representation of the female subject uh, was more concerned with a sort of reproduction of the patriarchal system that only uh, depicted African female subject as mothers, as sisters, as sometimes uh, prostitutes. So women were not given uh, their fair role, as if women had not contributed to uh, the history of Africa or the development of Africa, social development, cultural development, but also the political development of, of Africa. So it was a biased representation, uh, which did not actually uh, represent women fairly. That's why the first generation of women writers, like Flora Mapa, Buchi Emecheta, Mariamaba, they decided to uh, uh, engage in literature in which uh, they try to have a good representation of, of their female sisters. Uh, in doing so, they g gave them uh, more roles, uh, looking at the transition between tradition and murder and, and modernity, what should be uh, the role of, of the African female, female subject. But the specificity is her focus on what we call migration literature, or what we call migration, meaning the migration of, of some black female subject leaving Africa and going to the United States or to, to other countries, or how those women are going to represent themselves, uh, how they are going to define themselves uh, in the environment where they, they find themselves uh, facing issue of identity, of, of gender, uh, like the flow or the movement, the back and forth movement, uh, looking at uh, how the African culture is you know, represented and also how uh, the, uh, the, the host country's culture is also represented. So how they are going to look at the mixture that exists between Africa on the one hand, and also uh, the host country, especially the United States on the other, on, on the other hand. So then uh, the talk today is going to uh, look at all those different different elements. It's going to examine how they continue the trend of rewriting the process of, become, of becoming. So when we talk of becoming, we have the notion of being, uh, becoming, and also the notion of belong, the notion of belonging. So there are a lot of questions uh, that I'm sure those who are here will be uh, asking. And I'm just going to give the floor to uh, our guest, our sister, so that she's going to uh, talk more about all those different different elements. After she has... Yeah, and Sarah, perhaps we owe her apologies or explanations. Right now, in the Department of English, all students are taking their class. Yes. Sarah, Professor John, was a little bit late because he had to make the arrangements so that somebody will be placed in the classroom to monitor examination. So uh, we could have had plenty of students, but they are writing their papers. We even considered transferring everything on campus in the Department of English, but this is exam period. And again, Sarah, thank you for coming in spite of your obligations and duties. Otherwise, the class would have been. Yeah, my, 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 my pleasure. Okay, I, I just have a piece of information for you. Uh, a paper was, piece of paper was handed 
don't you mean asking the participant not to get connected to the Wi-Fi because there is a, a direct broadcast that is undergoing and then maybe your connection to the Wi-Fi may have uh, some damages. Okay. So the way we're going to proceed is uh, uh, we're going to give uh, uh, to the speaker around half an hour for her to share her, her, her work. And after, I will just try to uh, to wrap up, to give a short summary of the different elements, and then we're going to have a discussion. The audience will have the opportunity to give contribution, to uh, ask questions, or, or to make uh, to make uh, to make comments, so that uh, we can uh, finish uh, by by five. Yeah, let us. Let us. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Doctor. Now I give you the floor to share your work with the audience. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you all um, for being here. Um, those here, um, many of who I've met or just met today, and uh, also thank you to I think I hopefully friends and family and colleagues are also a class fam to my family um, <clears throat> to let them know about this talk because I'm very grateful. So first of all, I'm here on behalf of Chineke and my ancestors, um, and I greet them and those of us who are here at this talk. Thank you. Um, here's especially also to my grandfathers and to my grandmothers, and especially to my twin, my father, my ancestor, who reminded me to always check in with me, my God, and how I believe when engaging life decisions, interacting with others and the world. I want to thank work and everyone here at work. A warm reception. Um, just very blessed to be here, and also for the opportunity to present. And I've been here with um, the shout out to my people from SUNY Geneseo, uh, and especially to Kojo Adabra, who invited me to be part of our study abroad here. And we've had, I think, some very dynamic engagements um, that have been life changing. For for all of us. Um, so me, I hail from Chicago, born and raised, um, but of Igbo descent um, in, in the country that's now called Nigeria. I'm a transdisciplinary scholar, and I draw from, um, as uh, uh, Dr. Um, John just mentioned, from literature and film and other cultural productions. Um, but I also pull from history, and I also pull from ethnographic research um, as a way to tell, uh, I think, a very robust narrative or story of of the African experience. Um, and just briefly, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to share about uh, my work because this is a transition. This is kind of the end of something as I work towards you know, the, the manuscript and the beginning of something new, where originally my work focused mostly on any Nigerians outside of, the, uh, of Nigeria. Um, and how they insert their identity into their into their creative works. But as a result, my professor said I was doing too many things. So after I finished, I started to focus on what the woman had to say about it. And then that took me on a journey into myself, naturally. Um, so I look forward to hearing what you have to say and to, to all your input. And also yesterday when I came to visit you, you when the... Uh, uh, Samba and I were there, and instead of saying, okay, you have to leave, when your um, your exams began, you said, do you like some coffee? <laughs> and then we spoke for another 30 minutes. <laughs> so the hospitality here that you've heard about in Senegal is real, you know, so thank you. Okay, so um, I start with this, Wounds Full of Love, Woman Becoming by Ijoma Umubinye Yohu. Now, please, here and at home, my Igbo is very Americanized, so please forgive me, I try. Um, so I start with this poem as a way to think about an African woman, the effects of her environment on her body, and especially how she heals herself in order to become herself. 
The wounds are the effect of her conditions dealing with the compounded reality of Western imperialism and its race-centered society of patriarchy and assassination attempts on her womanhood, her erasure, notions of her that do not align with who she is or who she is meant to be. So for in order for her to become herself, she must find a ways to fill those wounds with love. What that love looks like, only she can describe. So this paper concerns itself with this love, the process of the Black African woman's ability to find it and to apply it onto herself, becoming herself. Okay, so uh, literature is one of many vehicles that African authors or African people use to represent the process of becoming self and community, thus adding to the repository of knowledge of African cultures, arts, customs, and lived experiences. African women in a recently post-colonial Africa vied to publish works that complicated the deep, the deep and deepened um, stereotypes, tropes of African women written by more readily published emerging African male authors, you know, as um, Dr. Gion mentioned. Well, contemporary African women publish works that reveal the diversity of lived experiences, taking on often taboo topics of identity, existence, and culture. Within this, Nigerian women's literature significantly contributes to shaping and defining African identity and African literature as an example of it, one of many examples of it. So using coming of age narratives, they take on themes, genres, and narratives that reveal and represent complex and multiple notions of um, African identity, forcing constant critique of neocolonial modernity as it clashes with internal traditional and global notions of self and community. Contemporary African women writers continue a tradition started by African women in the 1960s to use their ability to articulate who they are and what they have become as women through their writings and their voices. Where the earlier tradition was more concerned with corrective storytelling, where um, novels and themes took on the generalized derogatory or simplistic notions of African womanhood written by men, and they took those stereotypes, but instead, and wrote about them, but instead wrote more deeply complex and holistic narratives of those women as a result of their environments. The 21st century women authors um, write, uh, recognize the themes and works of their predecessors predecessors and evolved the writings of her story by taking on lesser discussed characteristics of identity and culture to reveal multiple ways of existing in the world. The silence, the taboo, made so through colonial dreams are now the themes these women choose to center in their narratives. So this paper examines and celebrates this phenomenal act of self-representation despite societal norms, revealing the way that specifically Igbo women, in this case, which I am also one of, um, in the Nigerian diaspora in the United States story tell. So further, I hope to display the way contemporary African women writers not only dispel misrepresentations by telling complex narratives, but provide solutions through the choices made by their main characters. Their coming of age is a process of recognizing their environment, both within the communal internalization, um, internalized normalcies of neocolonialism, as well as self-realized notions of self that come from allowing who they are to accept and interact with traditions of traditional notions of culture, society, morality, and becoming. Okay, um, so I'm showing this both with uh, the, the writers themselves who are part of the community that they write about and then their characters, you know, which I think can tell a lot sometimes. Uh, so Chimamanda DTA will say perhaps more honestly than nonfiction because you can say things you wouldn't want to say about your community or your certain people when they're fictionalized. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm not gonna go into all of this, but um, this is from, uh, I wanna make sure to get into the meat of it uh, from, as my students have reread this um, for class, um, African feminism from, uh, 
uh, Philomena uh, Choma study. So I said that neo, uh, European neocolonial is akin to W.E. the B. Du Bois's double consciousness manifested onto the African culture and society. Constantly, the African must negotiate a domineering Western world and how it views the African alongside often clashing reality of ancient traditional cultures. I tell, often tell my students that what we are fighting as African women and as Black women is not only, it is, um, I tell my students who are come from many different cultures, we're fighting both sexism, you know, and patriarchy from a European sense. So we're fighting the same fight that white women are fighting, but we're also fighting the attempt to derogatorize who we were as African women. Right, the reinforcing of negative stereotypes or negative, um, uh, let's see what I put here, um, uh, to, um, let's see, uh, to reinforce, right, existing systems of social inequality, where we had many different positions um, in many cultures, our ability to give birth was seen as divine. Right, and therefore we're given certain roles in certain communities, re uh, reaching back to ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet, you know, um, and even still to this uh, day, the, uh, um, some uh, community with a, a chief or a king cannot be without a queen mother or a queen sister because of the importance of the holistic uh, knowledge that comes from when women and men are together. Right, so our fight is not just oh, women need their rights, yes, but it's also to understand that a woman, when she is well, is very powerful within her community, and that needs to be told. Okay, so um, with women's literature, kind of going a little bit more into the reasons why they write um, in the nineteen in the nineteen seventies, especially after this first wave of um, literature comes from African men. Wonderful narratives. Won't speak down on it again. I want to speak holistically to our contribution to knowledge, but it was not holistic because it did not include our voice as women. So um, they found that there's a lack or scarcity of writings representation, representing women. Um, and much of the creativity of us was oral, you know, despite this. So it wasn't written in this these global platforms. Um, and then, of course, men were given the platform to write. Um, and their biases came out. And you mentioned some of these uh, girlfriends, good time girls, wives, free women, mothers, courtesans, prostitutes, um, and sometimes political women and workers. So <clears throat> what these African women did um, at that time was to examine the female stereotype images, um, but to shift away from the negative or damning portrayals and to show the African female aesthetic themes and topics which engage women writers, their language, their characterization, the forms they use, the images, and the like, right? So a compl complication of it. So yes, she's a prostitute, but what, ha what, what about her environment brought her to that? You can see that in the, the book, Joys of Womanhood, uh, Motherhood, sorry, by Buchi Amichetta. Um, yes, she's divorced, but what, what happened in her shifting in environment to get her that way? And what is her internal processing despite her silence in the forefront? And that's so long a letter, right, by Mary Maba, um, Senegalese's own. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, women, Nigerian women follow in this, um, this narrative as well. And the reasons why they write, um, some have said, and you'll see Adichie mentioned later, that uh, importance of being responsible daughters, right? Like I die if you're the first daughter, you have a responsibility to your community, to showing yourself well. You know, it is a just kind of on, I don't wanna say unspoken, it's very much spoken uh, responsibility to one's community, what power she has, she must portray and reveal in all the things that she does. Um, and then also the importance of filling in the gaps, right, as you mentioned uh, from the text from, from some of the men. And I say some because there were some um, filmmakers and authors who uh, I've read that were very well respected by African women at the time for um, writing some of these complex narratives, such as Usman Senben, who's one of my favorite um, novelists and filmmakers. 
Um, and so they wrote the woman as a matriarch, the divinely inspired or mommy water character represented as independent woman, the energetic rural or urban woman, the mothers, and the uh, occasionally passive victim, right? So this is some of the um, earlier characters tropes we're seeing in the 1960s and the gaps that women had to fill. Okay. So let's see time. I'm going to show you a couple of videos. I want the authors to speak for themselves. Um, let me see what I have here. So this is Ama Tadu from Ghana. Phenomenal woman. Um, one uh, is one of the remaining elders. And so here's to those who are the ancestors and leading writers of African women's literature in the mid 20th century, hailing from what is now called Ghana. The point she makes here to for, um, I'll, I'll go before, let you watch before I talk about what she's saying. My point is that when a woman has been socialized into, I don't want to use the word oppressed, right? But when a woman has been put under pressure, when she's been socialized into a certain space, and she is being that woman in that space, that doesn't mean that, you know, that's all there is to her. My problem with seeing African women, you know, the quintessentially women oppressed and so forth, is that it removes any agents from African women, as if we are just there, you know, to be oppressed, uh, to, to make babies. And mind you, if, if, and if you don't mind my saying this, yes, so. it's not all African societies that practice female genital mutilation. Okay. It's another topic for another day that I'm not going into. Um, so, let's see here. Um, so, the point she makes here to forefront a discussion about African feminism reveals the ways that African women are perceived in relationship to who they actually are. While African women are forced into societal, familial, and political roles, or perhaps choose to be um, notions of that womanhood, this is not all that they are. Um, there is a complexity and depth to not only who they are, but who they are meant to be, right? And so, again, speaking to this idea of how a woman understands herself in order to become herself, especially despite her, her reality or in light of it. So I'm also just sharing a couple books that you should definitely read from um, our sister, Adu. Um, and then, uh, let's see here. I'm going to just briefly talk about some of these texts of her generation. So I mentioned Joys of Motherhood a bit. Um, Anawa, sorry. You know, <laughs> uh, so it, let's see. Anawa is a story about a crazed, destined not to marry, stuck between worlds, uh, uh, a woman, right? Um, where she goes straight from her parents' house to her husband's house, and she's dealing with a moral dilemma um, that determines how her her destiny will will move. Um, but it's very very powerful in its ability to convey what it means to not have the opportunity to move in a way that is perhaps germane or, or, or um, natural for her because it goes against, it is one of the tabooed uh, ideas to be, you know, something of a healer in the community versus to be a wife and have to bear children. Joys of motherhood, um, as I mentioned, um, you know, we have a woman brought from a rural home with traditions, uh, traditional, um, brought from a rural home with her traditions into the city of Lagos, right? Where her husband is um, being heavily affected by the norms of, of colonial society, um, uh, servancy to white masters. And um, we have a character who is trying to be who she believes she is meant to be as this traditional evil woman, but clashing between traditional and, you know, this growing colonial modern, modern 
misogynistic society, um, but male dominant. So even her uh, her knowledge and power as a woman is constantly subdued by what she's meant to be by her colonial and 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 uh, and fraternal um, masters. And then lastly, um, so long the letters we mentioned the story of women forced um, to divorce, right? In this in this in a community that does not necessarily do so. So once one sister leaves the country, the other attempts to keep her head up and at the constant disgrace perpetuated by her husband. However, the powerful thing about this book, I believe, is that she is writing herself into freedom, into freedom of self. And that while others may not see what's happening, you, the reader, gets the internal workings of a woman healing herself. So let's see, I'm going to have to pick and choose who I'm going to. Um, I have Titi Dengaremwa. I won't play her clip, but I'll read her quote um, when she talks about um, here. So she writes um, in the late 20th century. So she's kind of a bit apart from some of these popular writers of the 70s versus 80s. And um, and then she also is a filmmaker like Usman Senban, realizing that film is probably an easier way to reach their people than literature. Um, her uh, So she says that I don't think of myself as a, a professional writer as much as such because I'm not disciplined. I write out of passion. I have to really enthuse myself about something and then it just comes out. And it seems like I actually have to offload what I have to say. So I thought, well, I've done this thing and I've been sincere about it. I put my heart into it. I hope somebody enjoys it. And you can see that in her um, her books, uh, Nervous Conditions, where the f series, the first book comes out in the 1980s. The second, the last one didn't come out to like 2015, I won't butcher the date, but it was in the, within the last 10 years, right? And it's the same character over time. So it's very clear that she takes her time and when it's ready, she brings it out. And um, this is a very powerful narrative. I put her films here, but I wanted to mention that these characters, the uh, first set, um, her character Tambu grows to a new century into a modern Zimbabwe. In the beginning it's Rhodesia and then it's Zimbabwe way by the end, right? She must ultimately face herself within her environment, determining who she is so she can um, be determined and told um, to her by others who emulate who she thinks what she thinks as a Western Zimbabwe woman should be. So what's happening is that Tambu was constantly trying to be what she thinks she's supposed to be as a Zimbabwean woman versus who she is. And so she's losing herself into this narrative over time. At first, it's a story of overcoming. I got to school, I have education. But by the end, we see that um, instead of moving towards herself, moving towards other keeps her in this nervous condition that Franz Fanon's quotes. Um, and uh, by the final book, it's all in second person, which is powerful because the you, you, you forces you not to detach yourself from Tambu. You have to be in her shoes, in recognize where she got how she got to where she's at i'm going to skip our beautiful dta um, because i'm writing about i'm talking about um uh evil woman anyway um and i want to shift into the to two stories that i'm going to focus on um so the last well i think i have two more poems but another poem by ijoma is for imperfect daughters for those who do not bow to tradition for imperfect daughters still trying each day not to call themselves failures you are here you are becoming isn't that enough so i use it to really speak to what it means to acknowledge one's trials and tribulations to acknowledge what they're dealing with and to acknowledge that that acknowledgement that that affirmation i am here is also a realization that you are on the path to yourself and shouldn't that be enough can we humble ourselves to recognize that that is powerful in itself okay I was thinking in this context, I should tell about Nigerians around the world, but I'll just mention a couple things. 
you know, that Nigerians are the largest pool of immigrants outside of Africa, um, outside of their own country, but they are also the largest uh, group of people, so that would make sense. There's like there apparently recently about 1 million, 1.5 million Nigerians globally. But when I ask, tell anybody who's Nigerian that they don't believe me. And I'm trying not to believe it either. You know, Nigerians are everywhere. You can find a Nigerian everywhere. But the places that we go to, mostly are the US, UK, Cameroon, Italy, Niger, Ivory Coast. So it's also important to say, show that the migration is not just out of the continent, that many of us move nearby as well. Um, and that in the in US, many of us go to New York, to Houston and Dallas, which some of us call Lagos too, um, <laughs> uh, Maryland, DC, Chicago, which is where my family migrated to, and uh, Los Angeles. A lot of Africans, regardless of, generally we move to bigger cities because that's where we have already established community. Um, and we also send a lot of money back home. <laughs> and like, I guess 6.2 billion came from the US alone. You know, I, I feel like the number wasn't right, but you know, still to say that we spend a, send a lot of money home, a lot of responsibility to home. Um, and I just wanted to kind of show it in context of other African country, African people coming to um, the U.S. that we have the largest numbers here, uh, 393, which the next one being Ethiopia, which I didn't know. Um, Yes, so many Africans coming, but so many coming from Nigeria, which speaks a lot to the ability to contribute more because you have bigger communities and perhaps more opportunities to bring your work out to the world. Um, so I'm going to also kind of skip past this, just trying to talk about the different reasons why um, Nigerians come to leave Nigeria, but it's the case. Um, but the thing that's important is that it's not always by choice. It's generally as a result of maybe be better opportunity, maybe you have family there, but also dire conditions, understanding that slavery is still real when it comes to human trafficking um, and just the conditions of you know the Mediterranean. I remember the, in a few years back when they talked about all the people who are dying in the Mediterranean, but they focused on the Middle Eastern people, not recognizing that the majority of people dying across the, the um, Mediterranean were Africans, especially Nigerians, Eritreans. Um, and a lot of women ended up in um, human traffic situations when they arrived to Italy and Spain. Um, so just giving that context to understand, okay, what does a Nigerian woman deal with outside of Nigeria, and in this case, the United States, in order for her, that, that kind of difficult terrain that she has to become herself within. So the books that I choose, um, there's the questions for a doll that I've been reading from, Fresh Water by Kwesi Emezi, um, and then the Binti series by Nnedi Okafor, and she's a sci-fi um, I think she likes to use that word. What would she use? She might use Afro-African futurism. Um, she's very particular about what terminology she uses, but very powerful in that way. But all of them are Nigerian women of the United States of Igbo descent. Um, they all, um, and they have a desire to deep, dive deeper into their culture. And uh, I say Igbo and Yoruba, um, but in this case, it's all Igbo. Um, since many of the novels are coming from them, and that's also my choice too, that a lot of the novels are coming from these two cultures. So I'm also trying to dive deeper into these topics. Um, and then all of these um, narratives, the protagonist finds herself or becomes herself. So for Binti, okay. So Binti is particularly interesting because the protagonist Binti is constantly moving between her past, present, and future, recognizing the importance of knowing and upholding her culture in order to become herself. She is a Himba girl from an alternate universe who chooses to leave home to improve her skills as a harmonizer, something like a mathematician who can communicate between objects, people, and energy with equations and currents. Since her home seems to have nothing more to offer, her, she leaves without permission to go to a school on another planet, uh, meeting beings, human and non-human, from across the universe. So throughout the novel, she's challenged to remember who she is, such as her traditional identity, rep repressed and unknown to her because they become taboo within their society. Also diving deep to remember the lessons of her father and mother in near-death moments, right? When a moment when things are tough, she's thinking about what she's learned from home. 
And each of these events forces her to, uh, to find confidence in who she is, which is critical not only for her ancient identities, but to accept new identities imposed on her during war um, to the point of even inheriting characteristics from an alien race. You got to read it. I'm not, I'm not giving, no, I don't want to give you, because, you know, you have to read it yourself. Um, so all of this allowing her power to, of both her enemy, um, she, she gains this new power and turns enemy into friend, both personally and within between races. Um, and she is struggling to move between these powerful expressions of self to find that harmony within her identities, let alone as a harmonizer. Doing this is key to finally being in a position to be who she is meant to be, a powerful balance between beings across the little, literal universe. So literally her embodying who she is and who she's becoming, she has to find that balance in order to become herself. So I want to share a couple moments where that's happening, where she's where she's tapping into herself. So she says, my mind was moving fast now, seeing numbers and then blurs. Good. I was my father's daughter. He taught me in the tradition of my ancestors, and I was the best in the family. I am Binti Eke Opara Zuzu Dambu Kiakpa of Namib. I whispered, I was born with my mother's gift of mathematical sight. So that like even speaking affirmation of her own name was powerful for her in this moment to find the equation she needed to, you know, help save her, her community. And then later on, she says, I've been planets away. This is when she um, learns about a remote community that has been taboo within her community, which is also already remote. And she finds out, I'm my grandmother's one of the leaders of this community. And the tools they have help her balance her new powers. It's insane. So she says, I've been planets away and learned about and met people from other worlds. It's wrong that I don't even know my own. Of, of my own, of my own people. I let out a breath as my worst sunk in me. They were truth now, a truth that had been different days ago. And so this is where she's coming into herself and accepting it. She's not running from it. She's letting the difficulty, the pain, the wounds, you know, but she's filling it up with who she is and she's acknowledging it, even though it's beyond what anybody in her community can understand. Okay, so I'm going to go to the last story and be quick about it since my time is running out. I have three minutes. Um, so um, Freshwater is uh, a story that brings in, and this is more of, even though there's a bit of people will say mysticism in it, it's also perhaps supposedly true because we're talking about traditional Igbo um, culture and spiritualism. Um, so in it, there are a couple entities you should know Allah is um, the uh, the author of fertility the queen of the underworld is on um, it is on her that we move stand uh, sit walk sleep and plant our crops so Allah is the word that we use to say ground earth you know but it's also the name that's given to the earth goddess of the Igbo people right um, and so within this story it's about a young girl coming of age in modern day Nigeria she's challenged to acknowledge her growing power as a child of the earth goddess Allah known for the power of fertility protector of children to come into the world protector cultivator of land and, um, of the evil people. However, in a society that privileges Western ways of being, religions, and taboos, there are moments gone that leave Ada, our protagonist, alone to ne negotiate who she is as an evil girl. For instance, there is one when she's at home and a large snake enters the house. Um, and uh, in a way that is natural to her father, he sees it and kills it immediately. But Ada and the reader comes to understand that this is actually a visit from the earth goddess and that it should be acknowledged as such, right? And so it says here um, that he snatched her up, this is the end of the quote, he snatched her up and away and took a machete, went back and hacked the python to bits. Allah, mother, dissolved amid broken scales and pieces of flesh. She went back. Um, she would not return. 
And so this seems to be kind of a metaphor of her own experience of growing up in a world where she has this power, but she doesn't know how to cultivate it because um, Allah is no longer presenting herself to the child. Then our girl is also Obanje. Anyone heard of this? Right, spirit child. Um, so the Banje refers to the, uh, the iron class, the one who runs back and forth from one realm of existence to the other, always longing for a place other than where she he is. I won't continue to read this, but I also understand this with your people, Abuku. Same, yes. Um, so if a mother gives birth and has um, a mis I know there's some terms here. Kembugu. Yes. Saga. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes, but she takes that term, right? And so it's like if the mother gives birth and then has a miscarriage, that idea is that if she gives birth to a child that finally stays, mm -hmm. right? And Chinua Chiba writes about this and things that fall apart, that all of those children who passed before are the same child, mm -hmm. right? So there is a power that she has as one that that moves or he moves between the world of the living and the world of the of the ancestors, right? So in this case, this girl um, is has this po um, power too. And as a result of it, she is also embodied by many different spirits, but has no, no knowledge of how to control it. So she becomes kind of, I don't know, I don't say demonic, but in a way, <laughs> she's not that great of a human being for a while. Um, you see, uh, she uh, coming to the United States, States without anybody to help her with who she is. She is isolated even further, and as a result, deals with sexual assault, becomes something like an ad ad aggressor, taking out her struggles on others through disloyalty, apathy. Within her, multiple spirits resided, a lost sense of collection to Allah, and she has no one to go to this, about this, to process it. So she has to dig deep into who she is um, and to understand the genesis of her turmoil in order to accept the many powers and doubt, doubt upon her and ultimately find balance enough to exist to herself in light of herself. So a couple of things that happen here, she's when she's trying to come to a sense of acknowledging who she is, which is a catalyst to her finding others who can help her to understand who she is. First within herself, then her community shows itself to her. Um, we have a saying back home, Ichiruchi Akanba, one who does not challenge their chi, one does not challenge their chi to a wrestling match, or spirit. It feels as if that's what I've been doing for years now, wrestling, as if it could end in anything other than my loss. But it's a relief to finally be thrown to lie with my back on the sand, alive and out of breath. You can see the sky properly this way. Besides, the sand is my mother and no one can run from her. And also in negotiating this Ogbanje, this desire to constantly return to the spirit world and being the child of Allah, she acknowledges, I knew that my brother's sisters, the other Ogbanje who are calling her from the spirit world, hadn't been serious about trying to drag me over to the other side the night before. The thing about Allah is that you don't move against her. If she turned, if she turned me back from the gates and told me to live, then I would have to live, Ogbanje or not. And so this is the point where the suicidal attempts stop. The madness kind of stops because she realizes she has to stay in this world. That her being a child of the earth goddess and the responsibility far outweighs any other duty to the spiritual world. Um, so um, to conclude, um, and I can talk more in discussion about this, but um, I, I end with another poem. The woman alone finding parts of herself she never knew existed will always be more powerful. I want to share this poem not to say that woman, that, not to say the woman by herself, but alone within herself or her spirit and cosmological positioning is responsible for determining which way her flower blooms. Each narrative um, pushes tap do topics, new genres and realities that young women deal with today and dare to reveal the, her, the redemption that comes from self first, but not without acknowledging, uh, without, not without acknowledgement of those around them, of them. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you a lot for uh, this uh, very clear talk, but also insightful and, and outstanding. Thank you. Uh, we have really uh, learned a, a lot. Now you have uh, first focus on the notion of root as something that is very important because when you talk about what we call migration literature, then the notion of root is really is really central to uh, to the to the narration, but also the notion of of, of interaction with the known and the uh, and the unknown. And what is also striking in the instruction, you have also included. What we can call the visible world and the invisible through the use of or the study of a spirituality. And the main focus was on the narration of of African African uh, women experience using fresh water, using bintu series, but also using a uh, question for other. But you have also widened the scope, looking at uh, Mayama Baz uh, uh, Solon Ed letter, looking at this uh, Dangaramba's uh, Dangaramba's novel. But what is more striking is the use of wound as something that is as a metaphor of all the difficulties that uh, the African female subject have have gone through as the effect of the condition in relation to uh, to the petrical petrical system and we is really filled with, with with love then love being uh, some of the opportunities that they have to fill in those those, those wounds in african writing africa uh, as i said it a while ago and as you also have mentioned it men were the first one to talk about uh, women but the presentation of women was based was really uh, negative according to the the female subject so women they had to uh, to write about their own their own experiences because men they only focus on stereotype presenting women in a very negative in, in a very negative negative way so in their presentation uh, they show the diversity of love experiences by African African women 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 writers <laughs> Then men really dominated uh, the literary the literary arena, especially after the independent before the independence, but also after the uh, the independence. And women, uh, they are just continuing this uh, this tradition of the early female writers like uh, Flora uh, Flora Mappa, Buchi Emichita, and and Mariam Mariam But and they decide to write about who who they are, especially after the independence of African country in which they had to find uh, find themselves between the tradition from the transition between uh, tradition and, modern, and and modernity. So then women's representation of the female subject is viewed as as a more holistic uh, representation, especially in relation to the environment uh, in which they they, they evolve. And you talk about a fair representation by by the female uh, by the female writers, and as an example, you have talked about Adichie's fictionalized world of of, of women. Uh, you also have talk about African feminism in opposition to 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 Western feminism. The notion of uh, womanism, uh, black feminism, masculine feminism, stewardism, all the different issues. Or have also talk about uh, double consciousness, especially in relation to uh, the migrant uh, women who face uh, notion of identity, but also who face notion of notion of race in in the in the uh the their host country and how those uh difficulties also affect uh the female subject who have to fight uh, as a uh, diasporic subject but also as uh, women uh, seeking to find balance between uh, their cultural origin and the uh, the culture of their host their host country and also the notion, the importance of being connected to the African African culture. Uh, women's powerful subject uh, story need to be to be told the the importance of of telling uh, the story of or the history of the uh, the of women's powerful subject. But also women's contribution to knowledge, which was really silenced for a long, for a long time. Example: When you take uh, the history of 
of the struggle for independence. When the story is told, you are under the impression that only men fought for the independence of African countries, that women, they were not really involved. And we all know that Nihanda was among the women who launched the revolution in Zimba, in Zimbabwe. So the contribution of, of women was really, was really uh, silence, the contribution to knowledge, but also their contribution to, uh, to different, different areas. Now you have also point out the reason for Nigerian women are to write. They write just to participate in in discourse like like men. Uh, why remaining to to the their mother, the 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 woman, the the womanhood. You have also taken as an example Ama Atu Aido, like with her 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 book, The Dilemma of a Ghost, in which she show uh, uh, Ato Yolson and Ilulu, an American uh, women who decided to come and live in Africa. And then she showed the culture club that uh, exists between, between uh, the husband also with uh, the, between the family of the, uh, of the husband. Uh, you have also talked about understanding as writing African women's writing as a way of understanding themselves uh, to become also to become also themselves. Uh, you have also taken uh, the example Anoa by uh, at uh, um, at I do. You have also talked about the choice of motherhood with no no ego. Uh, so longer a letter with uh, Isotu and Ramatu and and Ramatu like especially looking at. Uh, polygamy and uh, misinterpretation of, of, poly, uh, of polygamy. So you have really focused on different topic, different subject, different element that are all packed in a box and also unpacked in a in a in a box, uh, which makes uh, the talk a very a very rich one and a very insightful insightful one. So I'm going to give the floor. Uh, to the audience so that if you have a question to ask or if you have comment to make or contribution to 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 make now the floor is the floor is yours okay i'm going to give the floor to professor <laughs> professor sent first To go out very street and give some sacrifices. That's why you have a beggars all around. Because you need to have harmony and peace, equilibrium, balance in your life. To do it, you need to get to get reconciled with the antagonistic deities, supernatural powers. It is by doing that reconciliation through offerings that you will have a balanced life where normally happiness. Because if you do it, if you don't do it, you're going to be pestered by Ogban Jays. <laughs> you get my point? You know, those little spirits, those little unruly children. Texas. and deciding to go back and viciously, you know, laughing at you. All this is related with centers, after all, to the spiritual background in Africa, wherever you may be. You know? is determined that this world does not exclusively belong to men who can do whatever they want. This world has got another dimension which is invisible, but invisibility does not mean nothing. There is so much 
the human mind and the human eyes can see and comprehend. Beyond that, there is the world which is unknown to the and they need those who know in order to get reconciled with it. I always say, if the world was just, you know, uh, managed after the African way, we would not have before you confirmation, right? So these are the things I wanted to add, adding also that I am glad that you met. This is the beginning of some sort of cooperation. Sally, when you go to ASA in the United States, if you want to do public lectures or classroom lectures, he could. And next time you come with a student, why not have some sort of day workshop with his student and your student to exchange as young people seeing the world in the same way or different ways? Now I've talked too much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you a lot, Professor Sam. Now I'm, I'm going to give the floor to whoever wants to, to take it. Okay. I also wanted to say, you know, when he said that, I had something also like if, I, if there was a moment of becoming for myself it was rereading um an article by chino Achebe where he's explaining the evil notion of the chi and he just says something that i've told people and evils will tell me oh well, you can say it this way but you say it that way too uh because you know we all have our own way he's he says which means if your spirit is good you're good you know just as he said you know if your spirit says yes you say yes you know if your spirit is good you're good it's a guiding spirit. Yeah, it's a guiding spirit and then it's also the reality that we live in the world that does not vibe with your spirit so do you go towards it or go towards the world and then you have to deal with the consequences yeah. um, okay so i have a question for you you also somewhat answered it um so i think i'm going to ask my second question and I might pose the first question to see if you have any more thoughts. Um, but my first question was um, that a lot of the stories of Becoming provide insight about um, dealing with colonialism, especially the um, stories and authors that you presented to us. So I wanted to ask you, how do you think um, language plays a role in that? <laughs> I think that increasingly my work, you know, um, is starting to also incorporate the spiritual realm into what was once very much about cultural identity. And I think we've talked about this and I'm happy to talk about it again, that I think that language also, if there, uh, there might be multiple sides of this thing, but at least a triangle that is spiritual, spirituality, culture, and language. And um, we have talked about this, right? You guys say, I speak New York. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, speak that New York. You know, and that New York is Ebonics, that New York is um, the way that you are, ancient people, our, um, our shared ancestors were able to speak with their own tongue that came from various cultures in Africa, but with the forced tongue that came from our um, English oppressors. So um, I believe, I think, to when you take the link, <coughs> excuse me for my cold, well, ending of a cold. I've never had a cold in Africa, so it's new, at least that, that cold's happen where it's cold, but um, <clears throat> I believe that um, you lose your language, if you lose your language or, you know, because when I say New York, I want to show that you have something beyond English, right? Or that Ebonics or Patois, you know, that we have something beyond our colonial languages. Um, but when you lose that language, I think you lose parts of your culture because it is a, a roadmap to your culture. So I believe that part of that colonial conquest was to erase our language so that we erase all the markers that help us to understand how to deal with what's happening around us, you know. Yeah. I want to ask about that question because as you were 
speaking also I was thinking about that yeah. because you know like these African women writers choosing a language to write these stories yeah. there's a whole story behind it right yes. either the forced language of the colonizers and but some of them really like I think they applied what uh, what actually Chinewa Achebe said in terms of like using the English language but adding or changing it or using it in their own way right uh, for example Aminata Sofal in um, Le Revena so we have um, within the, the the novel that's written in French some songs in Wolof you know and when I interviewed her that's what she explained she told me that you know I am forced right to use French because you know that's the language that may be that's accessible in terms of like publishing because if I want want to write in, entirely in Wolof, I would have to learn the Wolof vocabulary. I would have to learn, you know, all the aesthetics that goes with the Wolof language. And my readers sometimes would not even be able to read everything in Wolof and understand it. So what I say, what I did was use the language for now, you know, and make sure that I, ac I have access to people who did write about women, but wrongfully did it. They did it in a way, for example, like if it was white Europeans, you know, early writers, the way that they wrote about women in Africa is mostly about the physics, right? Big boobs, big, you know, everything big. And um, so we had after independence, as you pointed out, right, male writers jumping in and correcting some of those, but also really romanticizing the woman in a way, right? That's not just a human being with, you know, um, attitudes, you know, beliefs and culture and all that. So in that correction, she said that the French language was more accessible to her because she's from Senegal and we study French at school. It's the official language. She's been to France, you know, and then she continued some of her like, you know, writing in terms of like finding her identity. So when she came back to Senegal, she said that she will continue using the French language, but just as a vague that's not what defines the content of her novel. That's why in her novel we would find the wall of songs. And in the footnote, she would translate it in French. So I think that was a very, a very smart choice in terms of right, you know, rewriting um, the way that women's history has been written um, in Senegal. So um, my other contribution is more about, you know, um, I don't know, I, I think we've had this conversation conversation about Bessie Head's short story, Life. It's a very interesting short story of a young woman um, living and growing up in Johannesburg, but then had to move back to her village in Botswana. And when she was in Johannesburg, it was a big city. She was a prostitute. When she went back to her village, they welcomed her and said, your ancestor had this piece of land, so it belongs to you. Everybody helped build, you know, her house. But then she said, I have, I don't have, I don't have an acceptable job in this place. So I have to figure out a way to continue doing that job, but maybe like recruiting other women. So what she said to the other women was that you would be going with other men anyways, right? Why don't you get money for it? And everybody was like, well, it makes sense. <laughs> So that's, that's what happened, right? A lot of, so the clash between like the villages that she found, traditional women, you know, who get married and whose husbands are going to see Life and pay her, you know, she, she was able to really like, start a very complex conversation about what jobs are, you know, normal jobs, what the woman's, you know, body should be, how it should be represented, what's agency. She even created a language between her and the women coming to her, to the village to, who were friends with her and who were doing this prostitution business with her. But unfortunately, the story ends with, she got married with, you know, one of the strongest men in the village. So this this guy said, I'm going to marry you and you will stop what you're doing, right? So she didn't stop. She was having affairs, you know, and she got murdered by the guy. And 
at the end, it was a very short story, but packed with so many events. So at the end, they they um, didn't they um, the sentence was six years for the husband six years of prison and that's it you know and I think Bessie had really ending the short story in that way brings a lot of like topics that you know we need to really like they think you know like uh, jail time you know um, thinking about submission thinking about the, the body of the, the woman itself and then what it represents but also the clash between traditional beliefs and modernity and lastly I really wanted to talk um, about what was it yeah. So so just the woman accepting to be like the becoming of the woman, right? So being, becoming, and continue. Like this is the continuation of, you know, the woman. And uh, part of like my research is also looking at the place of women in, you know, the movements. Most of the time we think about movements as male, you know, names that comes up. And I all the, all the time talk about it. And at some point, I asked myself, where are the women? You know, what's our role? And I think it's so rich that sometimes it gets, you know, just like mixed up with everything else that's happening or redirected in a way that kind of, you know, brings us even more complex issues that we have to deal with a lot. And I think work like yours, you know, like mine, and like other people's who really focus on the role of the African woman in telling their own stories is just amazing. So I really wanted to thank you for you know this amazing talk thank you thank you Korka. no i just want to thank you Korka, because you know you and i have been having some wonderful conversations so you know looking forward to i can just i i think that uh, what i can add to this is uh actually if you look at the trajectory of of women's writings it, it, it's just like the body the body is looked at as a site of resistance so you can see some women who are not who don't get married it's a way of not confirming to the political system that look at marriage as the only uh, end for, for a woman. And if you read uh, Sula by Tony, Tony Morrison, that's the same situation. Sula is a woman who is having low affair with any man, even with her, her own best friend, Nell Wright. Okay, and Sula uses her body as a form of resistance to the political system. So she's not abiding by what we call the heteronormative, by heteronormativity or the norms that regulate how sexuality should operate in the in the area. So the body then becomes a form of a form of resistance for, for, for the female, for the female subject. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation, and um, I, I find it very interesting, this return to spirituality, sort of as a source of uh, return to home, or as a source of um, uh, trying to link back to identities, trying to, and I, and I was just wondering, um, I wanted you to touch a bit about the background of some of the authors. Are they, are they all based in the United States or are they based in, are they Africa based or based outside Africa? That's one. And I want you to also link it. And if, if you could see differences and not necessarily differences, there are highlights you could see in some of the writings of writers who are based in Africa and some of the writers who are based outside in terms of their treatment of this. And I want to also to uh, talk a bit about knowing how um, the Igbo society and also um, a lot of African society, contemporary African societies, how religion, religion is a big, when I mean religion, yeah, I mean monotheistic religion and how uh, the evangelical movements, proselytism and all that, and also uh, Islam and other um, big religions have a huge impact uh, in their worldviews their practice and their devotion and all that. 
it's, I find it really interesting that despite all that, you see all these writings that are sort of like reaching back. And what do you, how can you explain this return to, to what at one point uh, writers sort of moved away from? Uh, that's what I wanted you to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. As many questions, <laughs> even with in them, the questions continue to unfold. So first of all, all of them are based in the United States. Um, uh, yes, all three of them, though, uh, Ijoma writes some um, questions for them. Well, I think they all travel quite often, but they're all based in the US and that's intentional because that's also my frame of reference. However, I, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that because part of my work, my uh, work thus far has been mostly Nigerians outside of Nigeria, Nigerians in diaspora settings, trying to argue that South Africa is also one of those for its kind of role as a transition to the West, as Nigerians there have told me, um, and then obviously being in the West. Um, but part of my work is now to shift back home. In fact, from here, I go to Nigeria to then say, okay, what is about, what about the Nigerian woman writing at home, you know, and where is she in this platform? Where is her platform? Um, which is why you see me, Parker, come to you and a few others to ask about the same questions about Senegalese women. Um, so, um, so to kind of like tie that to this other question about uh, Igbo society, as we know, the, I don't say majority, but many Igbos are Christian, um, Catholic, Methodist, Evangelical. Um, there's also the side of Igbo Jews as well um, in a country where we have kind of this tension between Christianity and Islam. Um, and then in the midst of it, you have these authors who are like, well, let me tell you about <laughs> the earth goddess, you know, and I'm not even going to talk about these, we're not even like, we're sidestepping it, you know, even to a sense, I think I'm sidestepping it too, because I'm like, someone else can talk about the wars, you know, um, let me talk about the reclamation. Um, and also, it's interesting because personally, I, I presented this before, and then my, my family's coming, and what they'll say, because I've never talked to them about these topics before. Before, but I've read a lot. Um, but first of all, I think there's something, um, one thing I love about in, um, um, about African, Black culture in the Americas, and I keep saying this, like my friends will tell me, oh, you know where you're from, you know what village you're from, you know this. I'm like, but you, you're still super African 400 years later. Can we celebrate that? You know, um, where I've met a Yoruba colleague who said he went to Brazil and they're speaking uh, ancient Yoruba, and you understand it, that even there was kind of like a, a radicalization of, of Ifa in your in Yoruba land because of the returnees coming back. And it's like, this is the, the survival is everything. The fact that outside of home, there is this effort to maintain. And I think perhaps that's what we're seeing with these authors. Myself included, you see me, I came, I said, okay, I'm going to the market. And I'm gonna get some of these clothes because these Senegalese women are killing it. Um, and um, I, I think that many of us, um, uh, well, it's just the evil, the writers that I find myself attracted to, um, that perhaps they, um, when we think about how do you deal with your condition, how do you deal with the racism, how do you deal with the white supremacy, how do you deal with that realization even that the conditions of your people back in Nigeria is somehow similar to your your reality in America and that nobody wants to talk about the difference between the two. I think that um, in the space of uh, intense violence upon body, spirit, and mind, that one then goes looking for something to hold on to, and perhaps not just a Nigerian, but the African outside of Africa tries to go, maybe it's inward, maybe we don't know how to speak about it yet, maybe it's inward, you're going inward, and to go inward, 
what comes out looks like hip hop, but it sounds, you know, like fella, or it sounds like some of these traditional, you know, music forms. Um, so I think there's something about I don't have my community in which to constantly find the solution or the land to to hold on to so I have to reimagine it you know um and so I the authors themselves um um she identifies as Obanje yeah. herself, mm-hmm. right? So um, in, I think at the end of the book or somewhere, she talks about the fact that this is kind of her spiritual book. So there's something autobiographical about it, like her own journey to self or their own journey to self because, because of the fact that she embodies multiple spirits that are male and female. She embodies male and female characteristics within herself and acknowledges that within American context. Um, uh, uh, Nelly Okafor, I need to just learn more about her, but um, I believe that she is, from her writings, she is someone who's digging deep into Igbo culture and then just imagining herself within it and then just creating works that all of these characters, you can take it to all these different worlds, but I'm looking at it like, hmm, that looks very Igbo to me, <laughs> you know? Even though we're in different planets and different worlds, but the structure takes her back. So I think there's something about the survival and a way of dealing with one's circumstances that it, the solution is, yes, in the Black world, we fight our di- directly with our oppression but then there's also the side of being african just diving into self and this is what's coming out of it mm-hmm. i hope that answer it's not an answer it's just a response yeah thank you. yeah thank you too okay like, uh, thank you yeah um, so i really like that question sort of about thinking about space and where people are coming from i wanted to ask a question about time so you talked about sort of an earlier generation writing primarily in the 70s and 80s and then a more recent generation so what might you know culturally historically politically they be uh trying to push back against to respond to or what might be creating these different responses in different periods of time and then thank you for a really great presentation. Thank you. Um, Dave is my colleague, so please stay for the first thing. Shout out. Um, he's like, hey, how are you in Senegal? Because he is the one from the mission that they've always lived in Senegal. I'm like, well, I need to just talk about it. Um, so, time, negotiating space and time. Um, so, learning to read between, to see, especially how this influence of in the generational conversation is definitely part of it. You know, uh, Atisha is so good at um, talking and speaking and and, and um, uh, acknowledging those who came before her. Like um, even like the Captain Yellow's son, you know, it was a very difficult book for her to write because she was trying to acknowledge the leaders or the people that came before her. I think um, I remember one author talked about the similarities between Adichie's um, purple hibiscus. Ah, sorry, I'm the uh, purple hibiscus and uh, things fall apart by Chinua Chebe and nervous conditions by um, uh, Cici Dengarema. And you can see the similarities where she is going from what she read, what she what she um, got from before, and using that as a as a starting point for a new wave of writing, a way of thinking. And in her case, and I use her as an example because I I've studied her perhaps more than any other author, as you know, from my presentations in grad school, um, that that was the beginning for her. And then she starts to experiment with um, with knowledge, with herself, with responsibility um, as an Igbo woman um, to write in her history. And then the clip that I skipped, um, they asked her, you know, how she thinks of the book. She said, well, this book is the, I'm not going to say the word, but she says it, the F you book, you know, because after having done what she thought was dutiful, she finally wrote what she felt was inside her, and she said she was having fun with it. Um, so I think that you see that with some of these writers, um, even like the new um, Yang Yasi um, from, from Ghanaian American, who writes this very powerful like narrative across generations of um, 
I mean, if you haven't read it, read it. Yeah. Home going, you know, every every chapter is a new um, generation between two sisters. But then after that, she talks about her newest book as um, our former Black Student Union president, Francesca Colon, uh, Fa Francesca Fatu Colon, <laughs> I got to interview Miss um, Gyasi um, for her book, Transcendent Kingdom. It's on a whole different topic than I've seen where it's not just migration to the United States, but it's dealing with um, uh, drug abuse, it's dealing with depression, uh, dealing with um, just many, many topics that are taboo, you know, in American culture as well. So I think what we're seeing with a lot of them is they read and they're ingesting and then they are writing, if it's relevant, stories that are similar, but then as they get comfortable, they start to go beyond into areas that we cannot yet conceive. Yeah. Said, but they can't because it's them. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Any question or comment? Okay. Yara has a question. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Um, so way earlier uh, in, in the conversation, there was something about um, that uh, Dr. Dion was uh, mentioning in, related, in relation to uh, your research and kind of the approach that you take uh, in incorporating both literature and film. Uh, and that immediately made me think of, you know, some of the things that we've been talking about while here. Um, and, you know, it came up even in the other talk uh, you brought up. Up, um, as uh, black women and African women as storytellers yes. um, and sort of how that kind of comes into play because um, I know that I had here is that only someone versed in telling stories will with more finesse be able to conceptualize the link between literature and film and how the and how um, like the very wide range of themes that both intentionally and unintentionally um, represent um, kind of like understanding that uh, that connection in some ways so my question uh, that was a long preface but my question was um, what is the uh, benefit of this multimedia approach and kind of seeing multiple uh, ways to interpret uh, to interpret uh, women's experiences yes fun thanks Yara Yes. Oh my gosh. I love my students. Okay. So, um, DGA starts off with a dangerous single story. She goes, I'm a storyteller. I'm like, oh, I felt, as you guys said, I felt that. Um, I felt, I feel it. You know, um, and, and you asked me this question yesterday, like, okay, you're talking about music, film, literature. How do you bring it all together? For me, I, I received them personally, and maybe other artists feel the same. I received them all the same, that everything is a story. How you guys dress every day is the story of who you are. Are. How you know we the, we cook here at uh, work? When you come in, you say good morning to the ladies, and they are talking. There, you're they are preparing together. They are creating community before they feed us. You know, at lunchtime, um, that's a, that's a, that's a story. You know. Um, I think that, uh, and I receive them the same. I can, when I dive into a novel, it's the same as um, diving into a film, the same as diving into a song. So if I tell you about a song, I'll tell you about Fella Watcher Naked No Enemy, and I'll be like, do, 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 do. you know, like, I'm gonna start talking. I'm thinking about the saxophone. There's no words. I'm thinking about the 15 minutes of saxophone beforehand and how that sets you up. And then, bam, he hits you with, you know, the story about water. Um, but, uh, I, I think that it's not, you talk about the multimedia with, uh, uh, with, with the arts, but I also think as someone who has a degree in African-American and African studies and a place like Geneseo took somebody like me in, um, uh, who crosses between, uh, you know, sociology and history, anything that I floats my boat enters my research. And I think what's important here is that the human experience is multiple, multiple is fluid, multiple is even too segmented. I think it's fluid. And that to tell the story of who we are, we have to be daring enough to cross over the borders that were created for us to explain who we are as we see it at any moment. Mm -hmm. 
So when it comes to the arts, absolutely. You know, you guys have been seeing your name, um, Gabon. I asked him yesterday what his favorite, you know, medium is. He says, I'm happiest when I'm working with clay. But he's like, I'm trained in theater and performance, you know, and he does film and he does. And I'm like, you're an orator too. He's like, yes, you know, so it's a matter of how, what do we have in our capacity to be able to tell our story. So personally, I see that and I can tell your story from, from any point of departure because I'm open to every aspect of life being a catalyst to how we tell our narrative and that everything has a story and that some artists will say, I'm not going to explain this to you, feel it. You know, so a song that gets you, you know, and you and Crystal are dancing. And I'm like, I'm just going to come and feel it with them, you know, you know, YouTube in Senegal being, you know, transported to Dominican Republic and you're here, you know, at the land here, connecting with your people there. I feel it. I can't explain it for you, but I can tell that story from my perspective. So I think it's to acknowledge that the human experience is that Griot's responsibility is to tell that story however they see it, and it cannot be boxes don't exist. Yeah. yeah. I hope that answers, or at least yeah. talks about what you said. <laughs> That's how I felt it. Sunk. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> the beating of the uh, and, and the impression that there was a drum and then the sound is really <laughs> is, is really so powerful and actually these are sound that are shared by many yeah. many African African countries and sometimes there is a meaning you know, but you have to be initiated to really decipher what the meaning is is about. Especially that's why why studying music is very int interesting. Last day, I I mean it was uh, on Sunday. I met a student who told me that actually he's working on on, on um, this is the talking drum. Mm. And that's what the dissertation is about. So you have a problem. Because there is a whole symbolic meaning that is associated with it. You have to look at the meaning of the different sound. Yes. Uh, and also how the different elements that are used to make the talking drum. And it's really very powerful. And music is part of Africa's, Africa's culture and Africa's identity. Okay, thank you. If there is if there is no more question, now we can just, just conclude. I think that the trip was uh, a wonderful one. You have taken us from Nigeria to Senegal to Ghana to South Africa to the US, and then we have come back to Senegal, and then it, it was really a very rich one. And uh, it's about imagining Africa, imagining our own Africa, imagining what identity is, whose identity, or are we going to talk about a plurality of identities? Identity when you're in Africa, identity when you are on the other side of the of the Atlantic. Yeah. And what does it mean to be an African? Who has the monopoly now to define who's an African, who's not an African? Sometimes my students ask me, who's an African? I say, no, I don't have the monopoly to define who's an African. Anyone who feels that they are an African is an African. So being an African no longer depends or does not depend on, on living in Africa or living outside of, of Africa. I said, being an African is a state of mind. Okay. A state of being. A state of being. Yeah. A state of becoming and a state of belong yeah. of belonging. Yes. Okay, thank you. And thank you all.